But the promiscuous lover is the lover that just wants to lick everything. I just, I just want to have sex with everything. And, I, and he becomes very indulgent. He, he, he's the one that wants to fap, right? He wants to jerk off all the time. He's the one that gets addicted to porn, right? He gets addicted to pleasure. So as opposed to the, the, the love, it's more sensual. Yo, Elliot. Yo, Elliot, I have quite an open-ended question here for you today. Basically, I'm curious what your thoughts are with regard to the shadow archetype and bringing our shadow into consciousness. And if you feel this has any relation to the demons of addiction. So let me kind of explain what he means by the shadow archetype. So if you're familiar with Carl Jung, right? Carl Jung was a student of Sigmund Freud. And I got a lot of, I got a lot of hangouts with Sigmund Freud these days. I'm gonna rant on him at some point about why he was wrong about so many different things. But one of the things that he was wrong about was his relationship to the spiritual aspect of psychoanalysis. In fact, his psychoanalysis was a usurpation of the confessional sacrament of the Catholic Church. Instead of people going to get a, a spiritual absolution for the sins that they had, they would go to a psychoanalysis, which was secular, and he would just listen to you and then either repeat back what you had to say about yourself or give you, you know, uh, affirmation, confirmation, or pat you on the back and say it's going to be okay, right? Psychoanalysis, I believe, is for the most part a waste of time. I didn't always believe that, but I can see it now. Anyway, uh, enough on Freud. He had a student by the name of Carl Jung who took it above and beyond just the psyche, and he had he had the idea that there was a spiritual backdrop by which we were somehow, I, I don't want to use the word manipulated, but like there was a, there's a puppet master, right? And that the physical experience that we have, even the, even the psychological experience that we have is mitigated, is, is manipulated by this spiritual world. He called the, uh, the numinous, right? Where we might call it God. And this was, as opposed to the Judeo-Christian concept of God as a benevolent creator, right, with a, with a definitive personality, right, which is good, right, his, his belief was that God or the numinous was filled with all kinds of stuff, right? It's filled with everything, some of it, and he was neutral, but some of it was quote unquote good. And these are patterns, archetypes. What do we call archetypes? Patterns, patterns that we could, uh, that could, could attach themselves to us or we could open ourselves up to. Some of which are good, some of which are not so good. And I'm probably, I'm even a little bit wrong when I say that because he really believed that they were neutral. It was how we related to these archetypes that caused it to either express itself in a resourceful way in our life or an unresourceful way in our life. So uh, Carl Jung was uh, preceded by, or he had a student that followed up with his work. You would call this kind of person a neo-Jungian, but, but he had a very famous one in the world of men's work by the name of Robert Moore. Robert Moore is the author of King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, right? And so what Robert Moore uh, built upon was Carl Jung's, his, his, his seedling of the idea that this whole numinous world, this whole numinous spiritual world, the archetypal world, right, if you will, was, was also actually broken up into quadrants, four, right? So he called, the, he called God or the numinous a quaternio, right? I'm gonna get, I'm coming full circle, just bear with me. <laughs> he called it a quaternio. And within this quaternio, there were, you could imagine like categories of these archetypes. And Carl Jung recognized them in the four ways that we can present ourselves as human beings, right? Depending on how we draw from these four quarters of archetypes, right? And so the way that it would show up and you guys have heard me talk a lot about this in this King program, right? Because we're talking about archetypes in a lot of ways, right? Is thinking, feeling, doing, being, right? Thinking, feeling, doing, being. And that's where we get thinking, magician, 
doing warrior, uh, feeling lover, being king, right? King, warrior, magician, lover. Now, remember before I said that they, depending on how those archetypes or how we relate, how our ego, really, the ego archetype axis is what he would call it. Depending on how that axis was formed between the ego and the archetype, it could show up in a resourceful way in our life or a unresourceful way in our life. And so, for example, a the, the resourceful way for the warrior to show up in your life, say, for example, a resourceful virtue of accessing the warrior archetype would be devotion. Devotion is one of the positive characteristics of the warrior archetype. On the opposite end, the negative, there would be the masochist, right? So this is the, the, the devoted warrior would be the warrior that does what he has to do for the greatest good. This is, this is what he does because it's the right thing to do. The masochist would do it because he's punishing himself out of guilt. He's a masochist. He's like, I, I'm doing it because I have to do it because I'm not good enough or because I'm not there yet. And he would, he would basically, you know, that like a masochist does, beat himself up in order to achieve his goal. So it's actually a form of, of, of self-centeredness. And most, archety most shadow archetypes, because that's, that's now kind of what we're aiming at with regard to the masochist, is the shadow expression of the warrior. The shadow expression of the warrior, or one of the shadow expressions of the warrior archetype, right? This quatrudio is the, is, is the masochist. You can refer to this as a, sh and he would often refer to this as sh the shadow warrior. Now, part of the reason why you would call it the shadow warrior is because he kind of rules from the underworld. We're not necessarily aware of it. Most of virtue practice, positive virtue practice, is because we're aware of it. We're consciously aware of it. We want to do the right thing. We want to do what's good. Uh, this is why, this is where moral law comes from. This is where why religion is so important. Religion affords us moral law so that we know what is the best way to access each of these archetypes, right? Even the lover, for example. A lover in his, in his, in his moral his moral righteousness is a is, is the is the I don't want to give a negative association, but it's the beta is the beta within us, and the beta within us, right, is that part that allows us to actually love a woman, access uh, it causes us to actually love our children, and to want to nurture and to and to care for and to create for them. You know, I come across as and sometimes a little upfront or maybe like abrasive with my, you know, people say I'm trying to be over masculine. Well, yeah, you know what? I'm real soft at home. I'm real soft with my wife. I cuddle her at night. I'm real, you know, I, I pray with my children at night and I, I hug them and I kiss them. Right. There's all that. That's that's the that's the lover being accessed in, in the right way. But the promiscuous lover is the lover that just wants to lick everything. I just, I just want to have sex with everything. And, I, and he becomes very indulgent. He, he, he's the one that wants to fap, right? He wants to jerk off all the time. He's the one that gets addicted to porn, right? He gets addicted to pleasure. So as opposed to the, the, the love, it's more sensual. And religion always tends to offer us the, a, a point in the right direction about how we want to access those archetypes. So if we're not practicing virtue consciously, then a lot of times we're subconsciously, unconsciously ruled by this shadow archetype, which is kind of like hidden somewhere. He's kind of like, he's kind of unconscious. He's, he's manipulating you from the underground, right? From the shadows. So there's a lot to be considered with regard to that. And it's not a, a dealing with that dealing with it is not a cut and dry issue how to handle the shadow is not a cut and dry issue um and there are lots of very various opinions on it like so for example joseph campbell says that it is within our shadow that there is hidden power and he says that we are to eat, rather than reject our shadow he says eat your shadow which means digest it and what happens when you digest something, it means, you, it means you take it in, you don't reject it, you take it in and you work with it, right? 
you work with it. And when you're digesting something, what does that mean? It means you take out the pieces that are good. Like, hey, there's something there's, you know, there's something in there that is actually good. So say, for example, the uh, the promiscuous lover, there's something in there that's good. Right. That that seeking for pleasure. It, there is a beauty in pleasure. God created pleasure. There's there's something to be accessed with regard to that pleasure so it can be pulled out, right? Like nutrients when you eat steak, right? You pull out that protein and the creatine, you pull it out, but then you shit out the rest. And so when you digest, when you when you uh, eat that shadow, you got to pull out, okay, you know, I'm not all bad, right? Like a promiscuous lover is not all bad. There's something in there and there may even be a gift in there. Maybe he has a most very good artists or a lot of very good artists and musicians, they're, they're addicted lovers. If you notice like, you know, like uh, a lot of musicians in, and they kind of like make it glorified and stuff, but like they're addicted to drugs, Kurt Cobain and stuff. So, but there's a gift there. There's a gift there. If he didn't have that, that, that lover in him, he couldn't create something with it. So you can't reject it totally. You got to be able to pull something out of it, but you got to kick the rest out. So Kurt Cobain would have been a much better artist, right? Had he were had he been able to curb his heroin addiction, right? I mean, he would have, he would have much more longevity. <laughs> he wouldn't have died, right? And that's a benefit. So that's one way of uh, of dealing or considering the archetype. Now he said. Now our question here is. Uh, bringing our shadow into consciousness. Yes, that's a part of digesting it, bringing it into consciousness because you have to look at it. You got to when you eat something, that means it needs it's being dealt with, right? You got to you got to deal with it. And if you feel it has now, the question is, do you feel it has any relationship to the demons of addiction? Well, we're talking about okay. Now it's good. We're on the right track because we're talking about the lover and the lover. Robert Moore says that wherever there is a a Wherever there is a, um, how do you say, wherever there's an addiction, there's a wounded lover. He says every addiction is associated with a wounded lover. And who doesn't have some form of a wounded lover, right? There's this love object relation loss that's associated with the break from the mother that is not mitigated or not treated properly in our culture. So there's a lot of that going on, especially, you know, I, I use this term not to make not to make light, but to be very uh, literal, we've got a lot of grown mama's boys, right? And so wherever we have that, there's some sort of an addiction. Now use the word demons, and I like, I like that because that's kind of where I'm at these days. And you know, the neo-Jungian vernacular has been helpful. Every stage that I've gone through has been helpful for helping me understand certain things. But Carl Jung, pulled much of his understanding from religion. Much of his understanding came from religion, and that's why he was rejected by Freud. Freud wanted to secularize it, and Jung, was he, was, he very much was into anthropology. He was into religion. He was into spirituality. And Freud was like, no, we can't, we can't have any of that. Um, there's a really good book. If you like the things that I'm talking about with regard to Freud and, and, and you know, and it, Freud did a whole lot to destroy Western civilization. He subverted us with a lot of bad ideas. Uh, e. Michael Jones, you know, I mentioned his name a few times, but he's got another book called uh, Modern Degenerates, uh, where he goes into the, tr the real history of Sigmund Freud and, the psych and, and modern psychoanalysis, modern psychology, and it's, uh, it's, it's sickening in a way. So you might want to check that out to see where I'm coming from with regard to it. But to use the word demons means you're taking a step. You're, you're, you're going back to the horse's mouth. You're taking a step beyond uh, Jung. And where Jung would refer to these things as archetypes and neutral. And he would just say they manifest themselves in the human personality or the human ego based on the e ego self axis because he also called the soul the self right the ego self axis and so he put a lot of responsibility on the person to a degree i'm not sure i've got the collective i've got the collective works of jung and i should probably read his work sometime uh, all of it but i'm not sure he ever refers to the uh 
I don't, what he would refer to is called inflation. He would talk about how somebody could be inflated with a particular archetype and that archetype would take over that person's personality and they would lose autonomy because they would believe themselves to be that thing, right? Um, this is like where people get various obsessions. Uh, this is, you know, for example, like the guys that really get into pickup, right? Since we're talking about lovers and addiction, the guys that really get into pickup, they begin to open themselves up to access their inner, like uh, Carl Jung would call it, I mean, um, Robert Moore would call it the uh, Eternus, uh, what is it? Oh, I can't remember the name. Poor, poor internus, something like that. It almost sounds like pickup artist, but poor internus. Anyway, it was like your inner Don Juan, right? You would start. He would start to access this inner Don Juan, and then because he's practicing all of the all of the ways, and he's thinking about it constantly, that he would then become inflated with that archetype, and then he would lose sight of who he really is, and his whole life would would then just be disordered. In a way, that's a kind of demon possession, if you will, because you can invite in these archetypes. In fact, you got to be careful because a lot of even Carl, uh, Robert Moore's work, he talks about uh, like inviting in the inner king. Right. And in a way that could lead to that could lead to a, a usurpation of your ego and an inflation. You got to be very careful and be very careful with that stuff. And so he referred to it as archetypes. They were neutral. Um, but our ancestors or pre Jung would refer to them as demons. And so you absolutely, if you are inf inflated in an unresourceful way with an imbalance, an arch archetypal imbalance, you could totally have a demon. I refer to that as a demon. I like the way de I like the word demon because I don't think it's neutral. I used to think things were neutral. I used to be in that, you know, black, in that gray, lukewarm, modernist, secular place. But I realized that that's chaos. I realized that's chaos. I saw it was chaos in my life. And I see it as, as chaos in the, in the lives of the men that I, that I work with. And so I'm much more black and white these days. I'm much more good versus evil these days because men need that kind of boundary. We need that delineating factor. When there's no delineation, when everything is subjective, when everything is whatever your truth is, there's pure chaos. And Satan knows that. And that's why we are at where we are right now, where nobody has any objective truth. In fact, even things that are straight up facts, like boys have penises and girls have vaginas, that don't even, that's how diabolically disoriented we are today. But even that is up for opinion. That can't be up for opinion. There are literal schools that right, that have feelings associated with math. I was watching this documentary and the guy was talking about how, you know, there are schools where probably like San Francisco or some shit like that, where two plus two equals four. And then they would ask the child, how does that make you feel? There's no feeling about it. But everything because everything's become subjective and we become our own gods, everybody thinks their feelings are important or their ideas are important, even though it flouts absolute truth and there are absolute truths so that's my little rant on that yo it's your bro elliot hulse here and i hope you enjoyed that video if you did you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent sessions with my king transformation students where among other things we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things related to becoming kings in our lives if that sounds like you and you're interested in joining a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way, in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word king, K-I-N-G, and me and my team will get back to you with the details to see if you qualify to join us. I hope to see you at our next meeting. Done.